Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome to today's program, Omar Nadi, who is Director of Supplier Product Management at Alemica. And today we're going to talk about why you can't ignore the inbound supply chain. Now, considering that customers are at the tail end of the outbound supply chain and companies across all industries are competing on customer experience, it's not surprising that the outbound supply chain gets a little bit more love and attention than the inbound supply chain. But the fact is that supply chains end to end are interconnected, right? They're connected systems. So what happens on the inbound side, you know, matters and ultimately impacts, you know, the end customer as well. So what are the main challenges that companies face on the inbound side? Uh, what action should they take to move up the maturity curve and how can technology help? Well, those are the main questions we're going to kind of focus on in today's episode. And it's great to welcome uh, Omar back to the program to share his insights and advice on this topic. So Omar, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Adrian. I look forward to, uh, to our discussion. Great, great. I, I think I, as, as, uh, as I mentioned when uh, you first logged on, uh, you're actually in the office, right? Which is, I think it's kind of a rarity to see folks uh, on the program today to, to be in the office. I know that it's very, there's limited folks there right now, but, but I think hopefully it's a sign of, you know, slow progress back to, to normalcy, I, I, I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. They, they've put in a lot of controls in place here. Uh, everyone in the buildings being, you know, pretty responsible, though it is for the most part still a ghost town uh, here and, and you know our our company's been very understanding of the challenges we're all facing right now as as spouses parents employees and uh and and accommodating that as much as uh, possible yeah absolutely but but it's a great it's great to see it's great to see an office setting that's that's for sure uh so so let's let's get into the topic uh you know like i, I just said you know the outbound supply chain and, and logistics you know gets a lot of attention but but the inbound side is, is equally important as well and so, so one, of the, one of the main challenges that companies face with inbound logistics? Sure. Uh, you know, I would say the primary challenge that most of the companies I've worked with are facing is a lack of control and visibility into the inbound side of things. Uh, a lot of these companies are using D terms or C terms for the suppliers delivering the goods and responsible for managing, managing the freight. Um, and when you know, you as an enterprise relinquish control of that critical component of, of supply chain management, it, it, it leads to uh, you not having visibility into, into what's happening on that side, right? And, you know, that even becomes more critical with extended supply chains where uh, lack of visibility has, can have an even larger impact, right? And it's, and it's not just the impact into visibility or, or uh, management, but also, you know, that lack of control can lead to, lead to issues at a uh, time of delivery, like, you know, carriers being queued up because they don't uh, have access to, you know, a delivery calendar or a container stuck in customs that you can't get out if you're managing that last uh, leg of the freight uh, or quality information preventing goods from uh, being issued into production. Uh, you know, there's a lot of unknowns and process inefficiencies introduced uh, through that lack of control. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, again, doing the contrast with the inbound and the outbound, right? On the outbound side, particularly on those consumer facing, you know, industries, right? It's all about, you know, where's my order? Where's my shipment? You know, we're, everyone's able to kind of whip up their phone and kind of see that Amazon tracking. You know, we talk about the Amazon effect and, and so forth. Yeah. But on the inbound side, you're right, based on the buying terms, based on, based on who's controlling the freight, you know, uh, sometimes or many times companies have historically lacked that kind of similar real time, in-depth, detailed visibility to what's coming in. Right. Especially if it's from an international side and trying to understand, you know, what the lead time is, uh, where things might where the bottlenecks might be, particularly if things are stuck in customs or stuck at a port, you know, somewhere. And that, like like I said in my opening comments, that has a ripple effect ultimately. You know, if you're a manufacturer that has an Im Im impact on your manufacturing operations, if you're a retailer or a distributor, you know, that ultimately has an impact on, you know, getting product ultimately to the, uh, to the end consumer. I think the other challenge is, you know, uh, and this varies by industry, of course, but, you know, you're also dealing with, in some cases, you know, thousands of trading partners, thousands of, of suppliers, right? So being able to 
you know, I think we've talked in the past about that long tail of the supply chain. There's a very long tail on the inbound side too when it comes to suppliers, right? Oh, of course, and, and especially when you're, you know, when we tie logistics, the logistics processes into, uh, you know, managing inbound supply chain, that becomes, you know, very critical when you're talking about raw materials and that long tail of suppliers in the raw material side of things, you know, are just as important as, you know, the ones that are delivering every day uh, because, you know, any of those products can can potentially shut down a production line, right? And and that's the, the biggest no-no, you know, the biggest thing that you're trying to avoid on the uh, inbound side. Well, that leads me to my next question, which is related to COVID, because I think that's what happened to a lot of companies when, when the pandemic, um, you know, first hit, right? And, uh, you know, it started out with China, but then as the pandemic moved across to other countries, you know, a lot of companies found that, you know, their supply, you know, key, a key supplier, a key source of supply was shut down um, or imports from that country were uh, uh, prohibited and so forth. Um, so I think they kind of discovered that, um, um, you know, perhaps some of the weak links, if you will, in, in their overall supply chain. I mean, in kind of looking across your customer base and maybe conversations that you have had, I mean, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the way companies think about their their inbound supply chain and maybe what, what are some of the lessons learned to date you think yeah and, and you know we're still in the midst of it right so it's still kind of companies are still kind of catching up and evolving their strategies around it uh some companies you know already you know employed resiliency kind of strategies into their supply chain to help mitigate that but it's it's always uh you know very difficult these are very challenging times supply and demand planning is more difficult, right? It's, it's harder to get a better understanding of what your demand's gonna be. It's hard to understand what your supplier's capacity is gonna be. Uh, you know, it's more important than ever to share as much information as possible with your supply chain partners, right? To collaborate, work closely with the suppliers to help them understand your production changes so they can kind of manage their own production um, and for you to understand their capacity constraints and, and how that could potentially affect you. But also, you know, as we navigate through these tricky waters, you have these rapid changes to demand and capacity. And then we'll, you know, ultimately when we come out the other end, there'll be a ramp up period where demand increases, but capacity is lagging. Um, and, and orchestrating all of that is, 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 you know, a major challenge in how these companies work. And, you know, they look at it, I see them looking at it through the lens of, of their sourcing strategy, uh, having closer relationships, with their suppliers, especially their strategic suppliers, being a better partner, uh, you know, making sure that the suppliers are communicating with them, are, uh, you know, willing, are, are gonna prioritize them as a important customer in times of reduced capacity. They're looking at their sourcing, sourcing strategy from the perspective of single sourcing uh, versus dual or multiple sourcing of, of those given products. You know, do they have confidence in their supply and how do they build that confidence in their supply? Uh, also looking at it through their kind of logistic strategy lens, you know, do we want to take over more of the freight? Uh, do we want to do things, you know, how, how does, uh, you know, do we want to develop more suppliers domestically than looking at ones that we're working with today overseas, uh, you know, employing central warehousing strategies, ensuring that they're, they're three PLs that they may work with, uh, are also flexible to, you know, reroute shipments as necessary. Uh, you know, if we want to, if we want to change kind of what we're doing uh, to to mitigate a disruption, and and looking at their production strategy as well. You know, are there alternate products that we can source to meet, uh, you know, these production lines? Is it, you know, how quickly can we change production lines based on what's changing? You know, the evolving landscape of our supplier base. Uh, and you know, companies have to be informed and agile. Uh, to succeed and gain an advantage here. And, and the best companies that we work with, uh, you know, are taking advantage of these times because, you know, I think one of the primary lessons here is, is that this stuff does happen, right? And you can't take it for granted and you have to have a resilient sourcing and production strategy that actively supports mitigating this. And, and you have to cultivate, you know, more close uh, collaborative relationships with your suppliers uh, so that you can kind of work through this together with those partners and that you're sharing information, sharing data uh, and, and removing latency so that you're making these decisions early on, 
you know, in the in the in the life cycle of an, an order, for example, rather than waiting till day of delivery to figure out that there's, you know, a potential issue that you need to mitigate. All right. Well, you mentioned a lot of great things that you mean. You talked about resiliency. You, you talked about uh, the importance of you know being flexible and responsive, right? Because these these types of disruptions. I mean, obviously, this is a kind of an acute type of disruption right now. But these these things happen all the time, right? Whether it's weather, whether it's a labor strike. Uh, some other kind of natural disaster occurs. I mean, these are things that, you know, historically supply chain logistics uh, uh, professionals have had to deal with and learn how to navigate around and plan for and, and um, uh, succeed around nonetheless. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we've did, we've done some research in this area too uh, over the past few months asking uh, folks about, you know, lessons learned and things like that. And exactly what you said. I mean, things that come up on top that relate to the inbound side is they said we, we need to, you know, look at how do we diversify, uh, diversify our supplier base, right? Um, whether it's, you know, across different countries or even build more domestic sources of supply if, if where it makes sense. And I think the other point that you brought up, which I think is critically important is, you know, the importance of communication and collaboration, really strengthening the relationships with, with suppliers. Um, because I think those that have developed a more partnership approach historically are the ones that, again, uh, have been able to navigate through this successfully versus those that have always been adversarial, right? I'm a buyer, you're a supplier. Um, and it's about, you know, hammering down on lowest cost and everything else. They're the ones that have had the more difficulty, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, support, uh, you know, because they haven't been there for their suppliers in, in the past. So I think that, I think moving forward, I think hopefully that would be one of the lessons learned is in, in addition to diversification of supply base, it's also how do we truly move to a more partnership uh, relationship versus, you know, historic, uh, 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 traditional, you know, I'm a buyer, you're a supplier, uh, you know, I win, you lose type of uh, negotiating, you know, perspective that I think has been the historical uh, approach. Um, so, so, For yeah, sure. And, and, and just, yeah, to, just to kind of uh, expound on that, the best companies we work with for sure are, are doing that, especially with their raw material suppliers. They, they understand that leverage shifts, you know, you're not always going to be have leverage where you can kind of pound on these suppliers like like you're saying you've got to understand that there's going to be issues like this or the financial crisis in 2008 or or whatever it may be that is going to impact their capacity and and you want to be a good partner a good supply chain partner a good customer uh, to them so that they're willing to share information with you and so that they will prioritize you in those times of supply so it's it's certainly something that we're seeing uh, companies employ and, and procurement part departments evolving from kind of, you know, negotiating always the lowest rate to, to being more looking at, you know, more variables, more inputs into that sourcing decision um, and, and kind of almost being like industrial engineers and, and, and looking at it as more of an optimization problem uh, rather than just a bottom dollar kind of, uh, kind of issue. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we, we've, we, we've talked about COVID being a disruptor, but also being a catalyst for a lot of different things. And I think uh, hopefully one of the positives that come out of this is it serves as a catalyst for really changing uh, supplier relationship management uh, to a more, uh, you know, partnership oriented, you know, one, you know, mo moving forward. So, I mean, if you're a company, um, you know, what are some of the symptoms of, of, poor, of a poorly optimized inbound process? I mean, you know, what are some of the things to look for to say, hey, you know, I think we've got some room for improvement here. Sure. Uh, so, so we talked about that, you know, the biggest thing that any supply chain planner is trying to avoid is a production shutdown. So you're going to have to mitigate that with, with you know, some form of, of money generally. Uh, the, the biggest symptom of that is going to be excessive inventory companies, uh, you know, carrying too much inventory to basically manage disruptions and, and manage a lack of visibility or and control into the inbound side. Uh, I've talked with companies that have, in some cases, 60 days of some raw materials because of their lack of confidence in supply. Uh, you know, a lack of visibility if, if you're the kind of company that's very reactive and not knowing there's an issue until day of delivery, you know, that's obviously, you know, a symptom of, of a lack of communication and a lack of visibility into what's happening in your supply chain. Uh, things like additional freight costs, you know, uh, if you have to expedite freight, you know, order a direct van, 
air. Uh, you know, I, I've I've worked with companies that mitigated this where they had a they had a you know were trying to drive down inventory and drive down working capital, and they they set some uh, metrics around that. And because they didn't have control or visibility into the inbound side, they ended up spending, you know, seven figures in one quarter in air freight uh, because they had driven down that inventory, but did not have the other necessary components of that to really uh, effectively manage all the variables going into their inbound side. Um, you know, a, lo a lot of these companies will have a large percentage of order changes, uh, unhappy suppliers, a lot of manual processes where people are having to touch every order, checking to see if it was confirmed, shipped, where is it now, was customs documentation provided, was the you know, certificate of analysis provided. Uh, you know, another symptom is how long it takes you to understand the impact of a disruption. If there's an issue at a port, for example, you know, do, does it take you minutes, hours, uh, days, Sometimes companies I know I know take two weeks to understand how much of their actual supply was going through that port. Uh, so so being able to kind of turn that around quickly and, and understand what's happening on your inbound side when there is a disruption is obviously a you know a, a symptom of a well working one. Um, and then you know the last one I would say is probably uh, you know a lack of understanding of supplier performance and the real to uh, total cost of ownership of sourcing from a given supplier, you know, all of this information that we're talking about, not just price, you know, but, but how that supplier is performing um, and, you know, what the freight costs that, that go into that, are there expedited freight issues? How is it, how are you effective when, or how is your bottom line effective when they are delivering late? Um, you know, all of that needs to, to go in and inform your sourcing decisions as an organization. Yeah, a lot of great uh, uh, insights there. I mean, I think obviously, you know, you start out by talking about, you know, inventory. Inventory is that buffer, right? It's it's always the buffer for inefficiencies in uh, and deficiencies in visibility uh, and, and and so forth. So I think that's one of the the clear signs there. I know we did some research earlier, and one of the respondents said that, you know, that they're carrying three months of inventory, you know. Um, so, so they didn't see, you know, the need to increase any more of their safety stock because they felt they they already have a lot, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of safety stock already in place. But, uh, but, but again, you could question whether you know three months is the right number for them or not. Um, you know, but certainly that's a lot of, uh, you, you know, capital, you know, uh, sitting there. Um, but then you're, you, you, you know, I think we saw the the flip side of that. You know, not having enough inventory. Um, you know, if you're in a very lean operation, just in time operation, well, then you, you need to have the right, you know, transportation and logistics processes in place to be able to, you know, do this rapid replenishment. And if you don't have that in place, then you get yourself into trouble too. So I think it speaks to the, the fact that, you know, these things are all interconnected, your inventory strategy, your inventory management strategy, your transportation management strategy, and, and obviously the, 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 the visibility that go, that, that's dependent uh, on informing those strategies. Uh, so, so I think those are some great examples there. So ultimately, I mean, what actions can companies take to, to move up that, you know, maturity curve and, and how can technology help? Uh, well, certainly uh, digitization initiatives are the foundation in my mind for visibility and control, right? Uh, you've got to take latency out of your supply chain processes. You can't rely on manual processes. You can't rely on email and, and, and mail and phone calls. Um, and data existing in, in people's heads, right? You have to have uh, remove that expensive latency and inefficiencies from the process. Uh, you don't know what you don't know, you know, and, and how can you as an organization make informed decisions when you don't have access to the data uh, in, in your uh, ERP system, right? And you don't have, how are you gonna inform your sourcing decisions, your transportation decisions, your production decisions, or have a coherent strategy if, if you don't have that information informing it, right? And and that that digitization doesn't just mean, you know, your suppliers, but also your logistics partners like 3PLs, 4PLs, tollers, uh, repackers, serialization uh, kind of uh, tollers too, but, but also extending that to even IoT providers that you may work with. Um, you know, IoT has kind of matured a lot in, in some of the use cases that we're able to, to leverage and take advantage of today. And, and there are some real value, valuable cases where you can, uh, you know, build, expand your network, expand your digitization initiative to, to encompass some of that 
IoT data as well to inform you. Uh, you know, we talked about this and, and we we're harping on this, you know, but, but working collaboratively with your inbound partners uh, to, to report on, on, on things, but also having discussions about the root cause of those issues so that you can address them, right? Not just saying, you know, this was, this shipment was late, but understanding, you know, why the shipment was late and making sure that you discuss that with that, that partner so that you can kind of, uh, you know, really have a better understanding of that in a way and a strategy for mitigating it in the future and not just making assumptions about why you think something, you know, occurred the way it did. Uh, also companies kind of move up in, in process optimization. So uh, when we talk about being more collaborative, sharing forecasts, uh, having your supplier share capacity, moving to more collaborative processes like VMI as a uh, replenishment strategy, uh, where, which inherently kind of shares additional information, gives your suppliers visibility into your forecasting, your inventory, lets them plan uh, more effectively for themselves, lets them be less reactive to order changes and things like that, right? Um, and also looking at things like central warehouses and your warehousing strategy. Uh, your logistics strategy is another important aspect of this. Uh, some of the companies we work with, they're much larger than the suppliers. They can get, and, and because when they go out to tender uh, or to bid to source their ocean freight or, or their road or rail or air, whatever they're doing, you know, they can get better rates in many cases, the suppliers, and, and they can work with those suppliers. Uh, so they can either take that in-house if they want to, or maybe work with their three PLs that they're bidding the outbound side on to offer some of those better rates to their supply base. Um, I also see companies working with suppliers to say, hey, uh, you know, can you use one of our preferred three PLs? And, and we have these four or five that we work with. And if, and if you provide that as a service to us, you know, that gives us as a customer visibility into what's happening in supply. So, so kind of using that strategy of, I already have a, a network built out to my three PLs that I'm using to, to, to deliver to my customers. If I can, you know, if my suppliers can use one of those preferred providers, now I'll also have visibility, uh, you know, into the supply side and, and that's a service that my suppliers can offer me, right? Um, and even doing things like making sure your suppliers have visibility into unloading calendars at your at your site so you don't have carriers queued up waiting uh, to deliver sitting outside and charging you additional fees because they can't unload for for a day um, so so to me kind of you know in that maturity curve step one is getting access to the data removing latency through digitization uh, step two is kind of putting process around identifying issues and understanding the, co the causes so you can more effectively address them, making sure you're communicating with your partners. Step three is kind of optimizing those processes and, and looking to IoT, uh, you know, looking to places for IoT to supplement gaps in visibility and things like that. And, and then kind of, you know, building a, a logistics management strategy to support your, your supply chain goals. And those are all, you know, great steps and you provide some great, you know, great examples there. I mean, I think one of the, the, the funny memes that I saw earlier on, you know, with this pandemic, as it relates to digitization, is it was, uh, you probably saw it, I know a lot of people did, but it was, you know, what, what's, you know, who's been driving your digital transformation efforts at your company, you know, and, you know, choice A was the CEO, choice B, you know, the CFO, choice C you know, the CIO or choice D, the COVID, right, the COVID. And uh, I think for a lot of companies, uh, those that have been, I guess, laggards in really digitizing their, um, you know, supply chain logistics processes, and especially on the inbound side, you know, this has served as kind of a wake up call to say, you know, we need to have that foundation um, and move away from spreadsheets, move away from manual processes. If we're going to, you know, not only survive as a company, really, but, you know, if we're going to emerge, if we want to emerge from this, you know, uh, better prepared to, uh, you know, succeed, you, you know, mo moving forward. And I think, you know, I've always been a big proponent of, of, of network-based platforms. And I think this is one of those areas where, uh, again, when everything we've talked about so far, we've talked about the importance of, uh, of, of uh, approaching that long tail of suppliers and, and, and trading partners. You know the importance of the visibility and, and having everyone be on the same page, if you will, in terms of what's happening from a 
uh, order standpoint, what's happening from a logistics standpoint, what's happening from a manufacturing standpoint and so forth. I think those are all things that, you know, being kind of on a, on a shared platform helps to, um, you know, remove the friction and the barriers to information exchange and intelligence, intelligence exchange across all the, you know, all the trading partners. So, so I think that's a, that's a key element there, but then you're right. I mean, it's not just about technology. It's also then, you know, leveraging that data, that visibility to look at your processes and understand how you may need to uh, simplify or, you know, change processes, make them more collaborative, perhaps, um, you know, to respond more effectively to, um, you know, a very dynamic and, and volatile, you know, environment that, that we're in. Um, you know, Armour, we're running short on time here. So just as a way to, uh, you know, wrap up, I mean, ultimately, you know, you know, companies need a way to kind of measure, you know, uh, if they're making progress on, on this front. So, I mean, what, what, are, what are some, perhaps some important metrics that companies should have to um, assess their inbound supply chain performance moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and just to, to hit on what you're talking about earlier, you know, challenge drives innovation, right? And, and, and that's what we see with a lot of the companies that we work with. And, and, and that's how a lot of the great companies and, and the great minds that they have, you know, employed there are, uh, you know, able to, to kind of address and adapt to these challenges. And, and I, what's important is, you know, not once you kind of get, get through this, this one issue with, with COVID, right? not just kind of saying, okay, well that we're done with that, but, but making sure that you don't have that short-term memory, right? That you, that you do know that these are things that you are, that are gonna continue to impact your supply chain and you need to turn it into a competitive, competitive advantage. Um, with respect to important metrics that, that companies, you know, should look at, uh, you know, I, I would look at percentage of direct material digitized, right? So, um, how much of how much of that how much information do you have access to based of, of your raw materials or direct materials uh, and if your if your business case is, is kind of built around administrative overhead maybe you're looking at that as percentage of order volume if it's if you're if you're focused more on working capital and inventory management maybe you look at what percentage of your volume is digitized but there's a business case to be to be built around both of those and advantages to for both of those so it's important not just to to really have your high volume suppliers but to to your point, to have that long tail, uh, there's value in every order, uh, you know, being digitized, right? And another metric I would look at is, is number of SKUs or shipments managed via VMI or with forecast collaboration. You know, it's a sign of a mature kind of organization and program that has good control over their inventory and forecasting data to be able to, to employ those kind of processes, right? Um, Metrics around being a good customer, uh, you know, it's so important to collaborate and cultivate these relationships with your strategic suppliers. Uh, you know, so looking at things like on-time payments uh, and percentage of order changes. Uh, so, so ways that you're kind of, you know, not being a good customer or are being a good customer that are affecting your, your supplier's ability to, to, uh, to run, right? Um, and then you get into kind of the more standard metrics around kind of on time and full, you know, it's just a simple metric, uh, you know, how many of your deliveries are on time and full, but you need to be able to calculate this, apply context to it. Was it a supplier issue, a carrier issue, a plant changing something last minute? Um, and that's where that, that process of reviewing the metrics with your suppliers uh, and your plant planners to find out the root cause, address it. It's important to have a regular cadence with your suppliers to, to, to talk about that because that's another way that you can innovate and find ways uh, to improve your processes. I'd also look at any kind of expedited freight spend that came your way. You know, how much, uh, you know, how much are you spending on expedited freight every year? Uh, and, and finally, I would, you know, we talked about this earlier. I would also look at, you know, how quickly are you able to complete an impact assessment when there is a disruption. Uh, you know, if you model a port closure, for example, or a supplier not being able, you know, declaring force majeure for, for whatever reason, uh, how quickly are you able to understand, uh, you know, which supply are, are, you know, which supply is affected, how much supply is affected. Uh, and also, uh, you know, being able to apply it to your, to your tier two suppliers, right? One of the, one of the things that's very important is 
being able to model your network and understand your, your, your second tier network because a lot companies I talk to, a lot of the things that blindside them come from the, that second tier. And you know, there could be cases where you think you've dual sourced a product uh, only that you don't realize that both of those suppliers are relying on the same tier two supplier. And so if there's a disruption there that it affects you. Um, but uh, you know, being able to kind of uh, complete that impact assessment, how quickly can you get an understanding so that you can start a mitigation strategy is, is another you know, critical uh, component I would look at as a company. Yeah, a lot of a lot of great uh, metrics there and, and things things to look at look, look at. I mean, the last point you brought up, you know, I, I related to you know supply chain mapping, you know, really understanding, you know, not only your tier one suppliers, but to your point, tier two, tier three, because uh, as you noted, you know, sometimes it's it's the the tiers further down that are, tend to be the 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 weak links, and uh, you know, companies have relatively speaking, you know, little visibility. Uh, sometimes to those, you know, further tiers. And that, that could be something that can ultimately manifest itself into a big problem, you know, down the road if you, if you don't have a good visibility and good handle sure. uh, on that. Uh, well, Omar, uh, as always, a great conversation, your, your wealth of uh, insights and advice. And I, I think we, I always say we, we always manage to scratch the surface on the topics that we discuss here, but I think you provided a lot of great food for thought and a lot of great uh, insights on why companies can't ignore the inbound supply chain and why moving forward, uh, particularly in this uh, COVID environment, um, you know, those that do pay attention to their inbound and, and put in the processes and the technology and focus in on these metrics that you just talked about are gonna be the ones that are gonna, you know, not only survive, but emerge stronger and, and succeed uh, in, in the future here. So again, thank you for making the time to be with us today. Yeah, my pleasure, Adrian. Thank you for having me. Great. I want to thank those of you that joined us. Uh, if you're watching this episode on demand, either at the Alemica website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for Omar, you can post it there and he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.